Okay, I think probably we should go ahead and start. So welcome to uh, this webinar. Thank you for taking time out of your day to, uh, to share this event with us. We'll try to make it as interesting and useful to you as we can. Um, if we can go to the table of contents, Matthew. Uh, we want to, first of all, give you a, a broad view of, of what our, our views are on the evolution of uh, the economy, uh, financial markets, and in particular, uh, currency markets, um, as the world emerges from the pandemic of 2020-2021. Um, we want to, uh, to focus uh, on the vaccine rollout and the, the impact that the uh, different performances in different economic areas may have on those exchange rates and, and um, financial markets in general. And we want to pay particular attention within those uh, financial markets to the rates markets, which are the, the, the interest rate markets is where we have seen most of the action since 2021, is where we have seen considerable volatility and a considerable repricing on the part of market participants for the prospects, economic prospects for 2021 and beyond. Um, the, we will uh, finish, uh, wrap up the presentation after we go over the, this rate, this, this, this uh, events in the rates market and the differential impact of the vaccine rollout with what we think are the, our main forecasts for each one of the major economies, the UK, the Eurozone and the US. Um, and then we should have some time for, for questions and answers afterwards. So let's go to the next slide. Matthew. Uh, the main drivers for uh, 2021 in the FX markets, most markets, but in particular the currency markets, are three. On the one hand, we've got, we have this sell-off that has not become worldwide, but uh, started in the U.S. bond markets, where long-term yields uh, rose sharply as investors priced in a faster recovery than expected, uh, and the potential for uh, some inflationary pressures as the uh, pent-up demand from uh, the, the many months of COVID uh, restrictions are relaxed while household balance sheets, household incomes have been relatively well protected from the, the, the effects of the pandemic by various, uh, various uh, government spending programs. Um, the main uh, upshot is that the sell-off that we saw in the US dollar in 2020 has stopped. It has not recovered much of the, the losses it experienced in the bottom of the pandemic, uh, but the traditional relationship in which high interest rates in the US attracted capital to the US, therefore supporting the US dollar, has tentatively reasserted itself, itself over the last couple of weeks. The second fact, important factor driving FX markets in 2021 is that the vaccine rollout has been progressing well, better than expected, better than everyone was expected. And I think as, as, as early as, as late as, uh, as the mid fall of 2020, um, nobody was expecting that the, the UK, for instance, was close to 40% uh, of its population having vaccinated the US lagging somewhat, but still, uh, at around a quarter doing quite well. And however, uh, another factor that, that, uh, that is driving FX markets is uh, that partly because of the differential performance in the vaccine rollout, um, we're, we're seeing economic divergence between the US and its peers. The US um, has continued to outperform economically its peers because uh, it decided to to overall uh, implement much, la much more lax uh, uh, restrictions on the economy. And now with the, uh, with the faster rollout of the vaccinations, even those restrictions are in the process of being uh, eliminated sooner than the, in the euro area. Uh, the option of this is that the US is expected to grow in the first quarter, whereas the UK and the euro area are expected to experience a, a double big recession of two consecutive quarters of contraction and not return to growth until uh, the third, the second quarter and, and, and the, the second half of 2021. So we can go to, we'll talk now in more detail about this, this global bond market sell-off um, that uh, perhaps was inevitable, but uh, the timing of it 
has it has happened sooner than most expected. Uh, as um, the vaccine rollout uh, accelerated, especially in the US and the UK, and combined with the uh, the uh, the commitment of the Federal Reserve to very low rates for a very long time, regardless of what happened to inflation, we've had uh, a sell-off in, in treasury yield. And basically, it's an environment in which US treasuries were yielding very low interest rates. Uh, they become a very unattractive asset when uh, inflation expectations rise, as they have. And the prospects for uh, returns from other asset classes improve uh, with the various with, with the, the massive fiscal rescue package that Biden has uh, the, the Biden administration has basically managed is, is about to pass through Congress. Uh, initially, the sell-off was driven by, like I said, by higher uh, inflation expectations. Now we are at the next level where uh, interest rates. Um, uh, real rates, I mean, the, 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 the rates, the rates excluding the inflation are starting to rise as well. Now, this is, it's important to keep this in context. Um, we have had uh, uh, the, the, this sell-off uh, comes from extremely low levels, right? And even after the, the uh, volatility of the last few weeks, we still have that almost the entirety of the U.S., uh, treasury curve, the, which is the rates at which the U.S. government finances its large deficits, are still below inflation all the way to almost 20 or 30 years. That means that as long as the sell-off remains gradual and doesn't go much further, it doesn't change substantially the picture. And it still means that the U.S. government can finance its deficits at very little cost, it still means that the structural deficit in the U.S. that is, is certainly going to increase is not an issue. But the sell-off, this, this, this fast-paced sell-off that we've seen, does highlight what we think is the main risk to our otherwise optimistic and positive outlook, both for the economy and markets. Uh, if you go to the next uh, slide. Um, why is it that I mentioned earlier that higher bond yields are the main risk to, the, to, to our optimistic outlook? Uh, rising rates can increase borrowing costs for businesses, one of the biggest supports for the, uh, for the economy during these, uh, the, the pandemic. And in the last few years has been the fact that uh, interest rates for businesses have been very low. So whatever investment has been, has been the businesses have been able to finance it at, uh, at very low rates, and in spite of increasing debt, their interest, their, their indebtedness at the leverage has not looked worrisome because interest rate costs in general have come down. If now we have a reversal of this process, um, this could be problematic given that businesses have uh, taken advantages of these low rates to pile up on silver ones of debt. Uh, in terms of markets, uh, one could argue that the 10-year yield in the U.S. is perhaps the, the more important, is, is one of the most important yields when it comes to discounting uh, the expected returns from other asset classes. Uh, we are in a position after 10 years of expansion and after the recovery from the COVID, where uh, U.S. stocks and stocks in general worldwide are very richly valued. Uh, people are willing to pay a lot of money per dollar earnings. And a lot of that has to do with the extremely low yields that are available in alternative asset classes, primarily sovereign yields. Now, if that starts to change, then the prospects for additional uh, risk asset gains diminish and we could even have uh, some retracement, uh, which would tighten financial conditions and be at the margin not positive for the economy. Uh, now, Going back to the forex market, what does what do higher yields mean for the U.S. dollar? Historically, higher U.S. yields have been positive for the U.S. dollar. They raise the attractiveness of investment in U.S. bonds and U.S. assets in general. And after some hesitation, we have seen uh, the euro come down, the dollar go up in the last couple of weeks as a result of this much higher yields in the U.S. However, uh, there's some reason to think that this time might be different because the policy context is, is very different from the 
typical context in which U.S. yields rise. Uh, in this context, which is again probably unprecedented since probably World War II, we have a Federal Reserve that has is carrying out an ultra like zero interest rate policy. Uh, not only that, which is probably, it's, it's no different from all its peers, but uh, what has changed significantly is that it has promised to keep those yields at zero, even if inflation rises. It has preemptively discounted the importance of any increase in inflation over the next year or two. That's a big change. And that means that the bond sell-off, the increase in yields has been driven mostly by inflation fears, not by expectations of higher real returns. And finally, we have uh, a bit of a unique situation in which on the one hand, we have a massive structural US fiscal deficit at the federal level with, with trillion dollar deficits as far as I can see almost. And this means there's going to be a huge supply of dollar assets precisely at a time where other currencies like the Euro, like the Yuan are slowly uh, being coming to be accepted as long-term stores of value. Um, and we have a situation in which two-thirds of world reserves are being held in US dollars versus only 20% for Euro and less than 3% for Yuan. Those numbers can only move in one direction of the long term uh, in the people moving slowly reserves from US dollar holdings to other currencies. And this is going to happen precisely at the time where the US is going to be at the market every year trying to finance um, an enormous fiscal deficit, not just in, through the pandemic, but even beyond. So if you go to the next slide, I think that this is very meaningful. This is a fantastic chart compiled by the Financial Times, where it tells you who has been, what, what is the net issuance of US debt, US treasuries, of the US government, and who's been the net buyer. And we have that up until 2020, we have a pretty healthy mix uh, the Federal Reserve through its quantitative asset programs bought um, a generous amount of it between after, in the aftermath of the Great Recession. But since 2020, the buyers, the marginal buyers for US treasuries have almost disappeared. And it has been entirely the Federal Reserve that has purchased uh, and effect, in effect monetized this debt. Uh, this is not to intimate that there's, there's something catastrophic around the corner. Uh, there's, there's no reason why this can't continue in the future. This is merely to point out that this is a very big structural change in 2020, 2021 on the, uh, the appetite for US treasuries. And that this very big structural change probably means that this time around, the impact of higher yields is not as on, on forex markets and the attractiveness of the US dollar is not as clear cut as we once was. So with this, I think I will, I, I, I hope I clarify our views on, on, on the recent sell-off in markets. I will hand over to Matthew to talk about the, our pandemic update and the rollout, the vaccination rollout and the, the different performance of different economic areas in this, in this, in, in this area. Yes, thank you very much, Enrique. And uh, <clears throat> hello, everyone. And thank you all for joining our webinar today. So as Enrique said, we are going to move on now and and talk about something that's largely dominated trading in the FX market throughout much of 2021 so far, and that is, of course, the COVID-19 pandemic and the rollout uh, of the various vaccines around the world. Now, news out of the, the pandemic has been largely encouraging so far this year, um, which has created this risk on mode uh, in financial markets, where we're seeing higher risk assets rally, such as equity, as, we, as we've shown, treasuries and Government bonds have sold off sharply. Um, High-risk currencies have rallied, particularly at the expense of the traditional safe havens. Now, cases out of the, the major nations rose pretty sharply, of course, at the end of last year during this second wave uh, of virus infection, particularly so, as you can see from the chart on the top right, in the UK uh, and the US. Uh, the US, of course, is driven largely by the relatively more relaxed virus restriction measures in place there. The UK with the emergence of this new variant, which is said to have been up to 70% uh, or increased transmission by up to 70%. Since early January, we have seen a pretty sharp uh, decline in, in new cases as um, these lockdown measures are, are reintroduced, particularly in Europe, and as the vaccines are rolled out uh, en masse. 
Most major nations uh, in Europe, of course, went into fresh lockdowns. Many still remain um, uh, in strict lockdowns, particularly if we look at the countries such as the UK, of course. Uh, if we look at Europe cases and, and the US, in fact, cases are now around um, October levels. In the UK, we've seen an even sharper drop, and actually on a per capita basis, as you can see from the chart, the top, uh, chart on the top, um, cases in the UK are now less um, than they are in Europe and the US, despite significantly greater testing. The UK continues to test around about four times the amount the US does and six times uh, the amount that the euro area does. Now, partly this is due to the lockdown, of course. It's also partly, um, as we'll talk about um, in a few slides, partly due to the vaccine effort, which is said to reduce transmission by around about two thirds. Uh, now, partly the reason why we're seeing these dropping um, uh, in caseloads, particularly in the US and Europe, is due to a drop in testing. But as we see from the chart on the bottom, we're also seeing a, quite a sharp decline in the test positive rate as well. Um, particularly if we look at the UK, the test positive rate is now less than 1%, uh, having been in excess of 12% uh, at the beginning of the year. So all, all, all very encouraging stuff. We're continuing to see um, some good news and positive signs um, on the latest death numbers, of course, as well. Um, deaths have stabilized and have begun to drop uh, in the US uh, and in Europe and dropped very sharply in the UK, having jumped following the, uh, the Christmas period at the beginning of this year. Um, now, as we'll show uh, in a few slides time, as I said, this is partly a result, um, or predominantly a result of the, of the strict lockdown that are in place. But also we are beginning to see some signs that the vaccine is lowering um, the chances of death, particularly among those older demographics that have received a greater share um, of the vaccines. Uh, the reproduction or the R rate, um, you can see on the right hand side, so this number of course has been uh, something that scientists, uh, medical staff, politicians have been largely obsessed by since the beginning of the crisis. Um, it represents the rate of growth uh, in the virus. Uh, this has dropped uh, largely below the level of one and has been throughout much of 2021 so far. So that suggests that on average, the average person that catches the virus is now passing on to less um, than one person and suggests that the pandemic is, of course, shrinking. So good news there. The data we've had um, on the effectiveness of the vaccines has also been very encouraging. Um, if we look at um, the Pfizer, AstraZeneca vaccines, for instance, there have seen a number of um, studies that have suggested that both these vaccines reduce the chances of uh, symptomatic illness by anywhere between 60 to 70 percent just four weeks after the first dose. And that actually rises to in excess of 90 percent for the Pfizer vaccine after the second dose. Chances of hospitalization significantly reduced as well. Um, again, the, the, look at the Pfizer vaccine. A study in um, out of Scotland recently showed that the Pfizer vaccine lowered the chance of hospitalization by 85%, again, only four weeks after the first dose, actually slightly higher for the AstraZeneca vaccine, was around about 94% reduction in hospitalizations. And similarly, deaths. Um, these two vaccines reduce the chance um, of death due to COVID by any, anywhere in, in excess of 80% um, after, uh, after just the first dose. So obviously, um, some very encouraging news uh, on that front, and that's generally buoyed uh, investors uh, and caused um, investors to favour these risky currencies uh, on the expectation that the worst of the crisis uh, is indeed over. Uh, now, as mentioned, restrictions remain um, pretty tight and were tightened um, towards the end of last year and earlier this year in much of Europe. Um, we saw countries such as France, obviously Germany, the UK enter into national lockdowns, um, other countries enforced tiered systems or curfews, closure of retail, uh, entertainment, that sort of thing. Um, and then that's provided quite a big drag on economic activity. Um, as Enrico was mentioning, the Euro area economy um, looks set to enter into a double dip recession in the first quarter of this year, having contracted in Q4 of last year. Uh, the UK avoided um, <clears throat> contraction in Q4, <clears throat> but looks almost certain to, um, or does look certain to, to fall into contraction again in the first quarter of this year. And the Bank of England, I think, is uh, forecasting 4% contraction in GDP in Q1. 
Lockdowns are beginning to be eased, of course, but only very gradually. Germany, for instance, has just begun opening um, shops, retail uh, shops, and but with a, uh, a cap on um, capacity. Uh, the UK as well, for instance, has outlined its, its roadmap for unwinding lockdowns. But again, this is going to be a very gradual process, five weeks in between each stage through to June. By contrast, we look at the US, for instance, which has um, taken on a much more relaxed view on these restrictions and have begun to ease measures um, much more significantly since the beginning of the year. Now, we look at this chart. This represents Oxford University's COVID-19 government response stringency index. Obviously, the higher the index is, the stricter the lockdown measures that are in place. You can see the UK uh, reading of 88 is one of the highest uh, we're seeing among the major nations and the highest it's been since the beginning of the pandemic. We're at similarly elevated levels in Germany, about 78, which again is close to the, the highest it's been during the, the entire pandemic. Um, but the US obviously was significantly lower here, reading of 64. And actually, this only tells part of the story. This index takes the strictest measure that is in place across the whole country. So this shows that generally that measures are much more relaxed uh, in the US. It's one of the main or the main reason why we think um, the US economy is outperforming its peers just at the moment. And it's likely to continue to do so uh, in the next few weeks and months, which does present a little bit of an upside um, support for the US dollar. Uh, now, the big focus among investors has shifted a little bit to the, to the vaccination effort, um, not just the global vaccination effort, but um, how each country is performing, the relative pace of vaccinations. Uh, now, the UK was the first um, major nation to roll out um, vaccines en masse using the Pfizer vaccine on the 8th of December. Uh, the US followed suit not long, not long after on the 14th of December last year with the first doses of the Pfizer vaccine administered. The Moderna vaccine uh, in the US um, followed not, soon, not very long after. In Europe, it's been a slightly different story. We've had a, um, a lag in both the timing of when these vaccines or vaccinations have begun and a much slower pace of vaccinations in Europe. So the EU uh, didn't begin vaccinations using the Pfizer vaccine until the 26th of December and supply with that vaccine has been limited since then. The UK, on the other hand, was, was helped um, pretty significantly and was able to speed up the pace of its vaccinations at the beginning of this year, once the, uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine um, vaccinations began on the 4th of January. Another big benefit of this vaccine is the fact that it's very cheap and also easy to store, um, <clears throat> which is significantly, um, as I said, significantly sped up the pace of vaccinations in the UK. Again, though, uh, the, the EU is, has lagged behind in this regard and didn't approve the, the, or didn't start using the AstraZeneca vaccine until the 6th of February. And again, much like the Pfizer vaccine, have had significant supply issues, which has meant they've lagged behind um, the US and the UK. All the while, the UK has continued to power ahead, as has the US, and the UK reached its target of vaccinating the 15 million most vulnerable um, by mid-February on the 14th um, of last month. And we can see from the latest data, this really um, reinforced our, my, my point, the fact that we're seeing the US, UK power ahead of pretty, other, pretty much every other um, <clears throat> country in the world when it comes to vaccinations. The UK has now vaccinated uh, more people per capita than any other country in the world, apart from Israel and the UAE. Around about 34 doses have been administered per 100 people. The US, not too far behind, um, around about 28 doses per 100. Um, but in Europe, we're seeing pretty slow progress. Um, most nations there are vaccinated around about 10 or administered around about 10 doses per 100 people. <clears throat> in the EU, it's, it's slightly less, around nine doses per 100. And the, the concerning thing here really is we've not really seen a significant increase in the pace of vaccinations. We can see from the chart on the right hand side, so this is the number of uh, vaccination doses are administered per day per 100 people. Um, you can see that the UK and, and US have continued to vaccinate at a pre pretty uh, rapid pace. We've seen a little bit of an increase in the pace in, in the EU, although it's been very gradual. Um, and the longer this goes on, really, the, the, the more investors are going to push back their timing for when the European economy can reopen. 
and the more they're going to price in this underperformance in the European euro area economy, um, and the more downside risk this provides uh, to the euro. Um, now, the pace of vaccinations should begin to pick up pace, particularly once the, the one-shot Johnson Johnson vaccine is approved. It's already been approved in the US, likely to be approved uh, in the EU in the next possibly the next two or three weeks, um, which should certainly help speed things up. And, and we're generally um, positive in that regard. We're, we're confident we'll see uh, a pretty significant pickup in, in activity, certainly in the second half of this year, once more vaccinations have been made available. And uh, now moving on, we, we look at um, the UK's vaccination programme here in a bit more detail. Um, and the UK has benefited not just from the number of uh, vaccine doses that it has administered, but also the strategy that it has adopted. Um, and this was a rather con controversial strategy at the beginning, was to leave 12 weeks in between the two doses of the vaccine, rather than three um, that has been used pretty much everywhere else. Uh, so the consequences of this is, um, as you can see from the chart at the top, so this represents uh, the percentage of the population that have been fully vaccinated uh, against COVID, i.e. have received both doses of either Pfizer, Moderna, AstraZeneca vaccine, whatever it is. Um, so the US is, is comfortably ahead in this regard and has fully vaccinated almost 10% uh, of the population. Uh, in Europe, sort of anywhere between 3 and 4% have been fully vaccinated. And the UK is lagging quite a bit behind. Um, uh, anywhere between sort of one and a half, two percent um, of the population have now been fully vaccinated. The UK has instead adopted this strategy whereby it aims to get the jab in as many arms as possible in the shortest possible time, i.e. prioritising the first dose over the second dose. As you can see the chart at the bottom, this seems uh, to, to be um, being effective. If we look at the percentage of the population that received at least one dose, the UK is comfortably uh, ahead in that regard. Uh, over 30% um, of the UK population and over 40% of adults um, have now received at least one dose um, of either the Pfizer or Astra AstraZeneca vaccine. That's roughly double the US um, and five or six times what we're seeing in Europe, um, which is adopted, as I said, that, that strategy of leaving three weeks uh, in, in between vaccinations. So we, we think obviously this is encouraging for the UK. It should allow the UK economy to open up slightly quicker than many of its peers. Um, potentially could have um, the impact of uh, creating this outperformance in the UK economy. And one of the main reasons why sterling has been favoured by investors since the beginning of the year. And now Germany, for instance, um, has followed suit with the UK and is now adopting this 12 week approach in between vaccinations using the AstraZeneca vaccine. The issue in the EU is that many nations have, um, have been very slow to approve the use of the AstraZeneca jab for the over 65s, and that delay has, has created a bit of a drop in confidence in the vaccine. The uptake is slightly lower, um, which is certainly not helping as a vaccination cause. And as we said, <clears throat> it, this slow pace of vaccinations that we're witnessing in Europe does present a bit of a risk um, to the European economy. And well, one of the main reasons why we think we could see a little bit more short-term weakness in the euro in the next two or three months or so, um, particularly against the dollar and sterling, which are continuing to power ahead um, with vaccinations. And now this is um, this chart, this just represents uh, what I was talking about earlier. So this is uh, a chart um, from uh, deaths in the UK caused by COVID. We can see from the, the lighter blue line, so this represents uh, the number of new uh, weekly deaths <clears throat> in the um, demographic between zero and 69, so the under 70s. And the darker blue line, that represents the over 80s. We can see that, uh, of course, the last few weeks, the drop in deaths has been um, largely a result of the lockdown, but also uh, the vaccine is starting to have an impact. We're seeing a much sharper drop, or at least a slightly sh sharper drop in deaths um, in the over 80s than we are seeing in the um, in the North 69 demographic. Um, so a result of partly the lockdown, but we're seeing um, a sharper drop in deaths among the over 80s that have received a greater share of the vaccinations. So obviously we're having 
uh, we're seeing uh, at least some impact um, of the vaccines in lowering deaths. And now the big question um, now, of course, is, is what kind of impact is the vaccine rollout having on financial markets, particularly uh, FX is what we're interested in. Um, generally, the market reaction has been positive, um, both the, the approval, distribution, uh, the pace of vaccinations has been much faster than the market had expected late last year. We're also seeing some very encouraging data, as I said, out of um, the efficacy, the effectiveness data of these various vaccines, which has really made them nothing short of, of miraculous. And the market has, has greeted that by favoring risk assets since the beginning of the year. Um, we look at equity, for instance, the S&P 500 index in the US is up around about 15% or so since early November and around about 2% so far in 2021. Uh, as Enrico was mentioning earlier, bond markets have sold off sharply, government bonds have sold off, uh, deemed a lower risk asset, um, and so have, have been sold off aggressively. Um, commodities have rallied, um, look at the price of oil has jumped significantly since the start of the year and the expectations for an increase in demand. High risk currencies uh, have rallied. Um, we look at in the G10, the likes of the Australian dollar, New Zealand dollar, for instance. Um, but emerging market currencies have underperformed. Um, the reason being, we think, because, of course, these vaccination programs are going to be a lot slower uh, in emerging markets than they are in the developed world. Uh, now, this just represents um, how the G10 currencies have performed since the beginning of the year. Um, we're seeing a general trend um, whereby the vaccine rollout um, and expectations for increases in growth are causing the higher risk currencies to outperform and the lower risk currencies to underperform. So the two worst performers have been the traditional safe havens, the Japanese yen, Swiss franc, that are down in excess of 5% against the dollar since the beginning of the year. And the higher risk currencies are generally outperformed, um, like so the Australian, New Zealand dollar, and then the Norwegian krona and the, and the Canadian dollar, the latter two have benefited from this sharp jump witnessed in oil prices. We've also seen this um, divergence in performance whereby the, the countries that are performing the best with the vaccine have seen their currencies outperform. So sterling, for instance, has been the best performing, best performer in the G10 so far this year. And the US dollar has outperformed six of the other nine currencies in the G10 um, since the beginning of the year. We, we generally expect this trend to continue um, in the next few months at least. Those countries that are able to vaccinate the most people in the shortest possible time should be able to open up their economies quicker, likely to see their economies outperform, and that presents a little bit uh, of an upside um, to their currencies um, in the next few months. Okay, I'm now going to pass back to Enrique. He's going to talk a little bit more about um, how the G3 currencies uh, and economies uh, are performing so far this year. I think you're still on mute, mute Enrique. Sorry. So um, let's let's start with the good news. Let's move on to the U.S. economy. Uh, the U.S. economy is, is, is outperforming major peers. I think that the graph that we have here on the right with the evolution of uh, the different GDPs in the U.S., the Euro area in the U.K. is, is uh, quite clear. Uh, we've had uh, recently yesterday the OCDE uh, forecasting uh, that the U.S. will act, GDP will actually be higher than before the crisis by the end of this year. Uh, the, the U.S. was the only major economy to post positive growth in the, in the fourth quarter. Um, and what we continue to see there is a consumer that has had its balance sheets and its income protected by this massive government intervention from the impact of the crisis. Let's remember first the, uh, the CARES Act passed at the beginning of the pandemic that actually increased uh, household income by over 10% in the, in the month of March in the form of uh, massive increases in unemployment payments and a, a $2,000 check to, to most Americans. 
Now, on top of that, we have the, uh, the Biden package, the 1.9 trillion package, which consists almost exclusively of direct transfers to households, also to households in the medium and lower uh, range of the income distribution, which are the ones that are most likely to immediately spend uh, their, their earnings. Not surprising that we're having to see retail sales uh, blow out estimates by 5.3% in January. In February, they also were much higher than expected. Uh, services uh, PMI, the PMI is an index that measures the, uh, the optimism and the, the evolution of, uh, of uh, sales according to the, uh, the managers of the largest companies. And this reach in, in, in February, the highest since April 14, uh, 59.8, which is consistent with very strong expansion. Again, by way of comparison, the services PMI in the Eurozone and in the UK continue to be below 50, meaning that they're still contracted. Um, in addition to this 1.9 stimulus plan that has passed through Congress, 1.9, uh, again, uh, direct spending, direct transfers to households with no offsetting tax revenues. Uh, the Federal Reserve has indicated that there's no rate hikes. Um, there's going to be no uh, let up on the pace of monetization of debt for the horizon, and that it will ignore. It has made it very clear, and this is this is a, a big change, that it will ignore um, inflation pressures at least for the short and medium term. This is this. Uh, Clearly, in the short term, the, this can only be positive for the U.S. economy, uh, for consumption. Uh, the medium and long-term consequences are less clear, but in the short term, uh, the U.S. is clearly going to lead the world out of the pandemic-induced uh, recession. So let's go to the other good but not great. I mean, first, first, what is the impact of the U.S. dollar? Um, the U.S. dollar sold off after the initial rally in the crisis. Um, the impressive rollout in the vaccine, the lower level of restrictions and the uh, consequent uh, economic outperformance has first caused rise in bond yields as we saw in the beginning part of the presentation. And this rise in bond yields have allowed the dollar to stabilize on itself in 2020. We do not think that there's much more room to run. We think that this time around the, the higher US yields will not cause a, a significant worldwide uh, US dollar rally. But it's clear that, uh, that the immediate in the short term, uh, the sell-off in the US dollar has come to an end and we'll probably we expect to see some stability around these levels. So if we go to the next slide. Uh, the Eurozone um, is faltering if compared to the US. I mean, tight restrictions is still better. Let's let's uh, not forget that uh, the, the the dire predictions that were made back in the summer uh, have not come to pass. But nevertheless, um, the the revisions are not been as positive, and the latest revision have been down uh, as a consequence of the restrictions imposed by the second and third wave in the different countries. Uh, fourth quarter growth was negative. First quarter growth is probably going to be negative as well, which means uh, that the US will, that the euro area will experience uh, formally a double dip recession defined as two consecutive quarters of negative growth. Uh, the composite PMI is the surface, this index, leading index of economic activity that I mentioned earlier, uh, which blends both services and industrial. Uh, confidence and, and economic uh, activity into one index has remained stuck below 50, which is the, the, the 50 is the line that separates an, an increasing economic activity from contracting economic activity. Uh, so it looks like the rebound in economic activity will be delayed definitely into the second quarter, perhaps into the third quarter, uh, which is at least one quarter delayed versus what we're seeing in the United States. As a consequence, the latest European Central Bank communications have been dovish, unlike the Federal Reserve, which has, uh, it was, seems to be relatively uh, not in, unconcerned with rising bond yields in, in the US, and actually seems to say that so far, uh, the sell-off is, is positive, is a sign of uh, optimism about the success of the Federal Reserve policies. The European Central Bank has voiced uh, significant concern and has hinted that it could accelerate the purchase and the monetization of 
of sovereign debt in order to prevent those recent yields from uh, from from damaging this 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 fragile recovery. Uh, the will know that the vaccination program, the rollout in the European Union compared to uh, its major peers in the UK and the US primarily has been uh, disappointing, has created quite a bit of political strife. Uh, this means that the bloc economy could underperform over the short and medium term, remaining the, the next of 2021. Uh, we do expect the the European Union economy to make up most of uh, the lost ground by 2022 as uh, COVID restrictions are completely phased out and we, we go back to normal. So the next slide. As a result, so we have the mirror image from, uh, from uh, the US dollar. The euro performed very well in 2020. Uh, a big part of that outperformance was that uh, the aggressive intervention by the European Central Bank and European Union authorities in, in markets and in terms of uh, the programs launched to ensure uh, the viability of the euro, I think dispelled any lingering doubts that there might have been about the uh, future of the euro. Um, that was very positive for the euro. It, we saw the, the rally, a strong rally since May, uh, the faltering vaccination program and the resulting economic uh, delay in the economic recovery means that probably the rally in the short term has come to an end and we expect uh, the euro to flop around here for the next few months. Our next uh, slide. Uh, the, UK, the UK economy, it's uh, navigating somewhere between these two ends. Uh, the near-term outlook isn't great, but uh, we think that the very successful vaccine rollout augurs well for a strong rebound later in the year where it will largely make up all the ground that is losing compared to the United States. It is true that the, lot, the, 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 the contraction in the first quarter will be even worse than in Europe, uh, to be expected given the... Uh, the strictness of the UK lockdown, the, uh, the probably the most strict in, in among any major European countries, but uh, the the plans to unwind the, the lockdown measures are here, um, and we think that uh, again because of the of the excellent progress in the vaccine front, the lockdown the the release from the lockdown will be much more aggressive. Uh, than in Europe, and we expect to see some really significant bounce back in the U in the UK economy earlier than in Europe, in as early as Q2 and continuing into Q3. And in fact, uh, if we uh, look at the, the third large currency that our clients probably care about, which is sterling, in the next slide, uh, we see that, uh, that sterling has been the best performing G10 currency so far in 2021. It has even outperformed the US dollar in spite of this, this uh, uh, significant increase in US yields. Uh, we have that uh, a combination of factors, um, the removal of the worst case scenario for Brexit has definitely helped sentiment. Uh, and the, uh, and the, the second factor, obviously, is the uh, very impressive vaccination rollout in the UK. And as a consequence of these two, the Bank of England has been able to adopt a wait and see attitude as opposed to the European Central Bank, which it continues to probably at least consider the possibility of further, further monetary stimulus. The Bank of England has made it clear that this, it does not intend to cut rates to negative levels and that is probably happy to monitor the situation and let the current stimulus measures and the removal of the restrictions do the work of lifting the economy. Okay, excellent. I think that covers everything that we're going to cover in today's presentation. Um, we do have a little bit of time left. If you, any of you do have questions as a, as a Q&A, uh, function in, in Zoom. If you do have questions, please feel free to, to type them in now. We can get around to answering them.
Yes, absolutely. Uh, the presentation, we can probably make sure that everybody who, uh, the question is, if we get, is it possible to receive the presentation by, by email? And we definitely will email it to everybody who registered to the, to the seminar. I don't think that's that's a problem, right, Matthew? Yeah, I think we did that. We might have done that last time, I seem to remember. So that'd be absolutely fine. Yeah, we'll, we'll happily uh, email this round so we also have um, uh, access to the presentation. Yeah, no problem. Predictions on rates for US GBP and GBP Euro by the end of 2021. I think, Matthew, do you have the, our latest uh, forecast? Yeah, so, I mean, as we've mentioned, we're still re relatively uh, bullish for the dollar in, in the short term, in the very short term. We still think we could see a little bit more of a stabilization in the dollar in the near term, as we mentioned, as bonds can, bond yields continue to rise, the US economy continues to outperform. But, um, for the sort of end of this year, the more longer term, we're still uh, bearish on the dollar against the pound. Um, I think our forecasts um, are for st sterling dollar cable to, to, to reach around about the 140 level. So we think there's a little bit of a room for a, uh, an upside surprise there, particularly given that the, the UK's uh, very impressive vaccine rollout. Uh, and sterling against the euro, I think we our forecasts are for a relatively flat. Um, at sterling against the euro, um, I think just below um, current levels. Um, seeing the, the, the rally that we've seen in sterling in the last um, few weeks has perhaps been a little bit um, over exaggerated. We've seen a little bit of a move higher that's been um, slightly quicker than we had expected, slightly faster than our forecast. So we could see a little bit of a, uh, a move lower in the sterling euro cross in the short term, a little bit more of a stabilization we think just below current levels. The question is, uh, are there any emerging markets outperforming or expected to outperform? Um, we think that as long as the, the sell-off or the, the backup in US yields remains uh, gradual and not this, it doesn't become disorderly. This is a very, very positive environment for emerging markets in general. Uh, the combination of uh, extremely stimulative fiscal and monetary policy from developed markets uh, everywhere is very bullish for uh, commodities, uh, risk assets in general, but especially commodities. And we think that there's a, there's a potential for, for investors to seek the yield uh, and the returns that is going to be hard to find in, in, the, in developed markets, in emerging markets instead. So uh, generally, uh, emerging market currencies are at levels that I would consider to be cheap. Uh, valuations are, are uh, very reasonable. Um, and there's a number of emerging markets out there uh, that uh, have and sustainable economic fundamentals. I think one of them would be the Russian ruble. Um, the other one would be perhaps the Brazilian real in spite of the recent headlines. And both of those we think have, have potential for appreciation. So I'll let Matthew answer the next. Yes, uh, so the question is, is sterling like to be lower uh, than current levels in the short term against African currencies or only the, the dollar and the euro? Um, yeah, it's difficult. I think generally when we look at uh, emerging markets, particularly those in Africa, actually, that they seem to be very much um, driven by idiosyncratic factors rather than um, sort of the broad market. So it would be difficult to say um, for certain whether we think sterling is going to outperform or underperform African currencies in general. Um, but, but I think you know, uh, overall our, our thoughts on sterling um, are still pretty optimistic. As I said, we think that the recent rally perhaps has gone a little bit too far as well. We've seen investors perhaps uh, profit taking in the last couple of weeks or so as, as they've pushed it um, significantly higher so far in 2021. And um, so potential for a little bit of a, a move lower in the short term, I would have thought. Um, if before the end of this quarter, there's only two or three weeks left um, for the end of the quarter. But over that longer term, I mean, we're still optimistic on sterling. Um, 
but also optimistic on on emerging markets. So I think that they could potentially both move in tandem. It would just be the degree in which they're rallying. Um, certainly, we expect both um, sterling and African most African currencies to rally this year against the US dollar. Okay, so perhaps time to uh, wrap it up, Matthew. Yeah, I, unless we have any more, do you have another question? No. Uh, yeah, if you don't have any other questions, I think we've pretty much covered everything if we want to. Thank you very much for attending, everybody. I appreciate your time. Yes, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, we, we were hoping to do another one of these probably in the next two or three months or so, I would have thought. Yes. Yeah. Excellent, thank you everyone. Thank you everyone, bye-bye.